together and why, um, the different things that I reflected on as I went through this process. Um, it's called The First Kristen, The Story of a Naming, and it is a memoir that I have written about the experience of being named after a deceased sibling. So I'll start off with the first couple of pages, which of course um, is a stepping off point and will we'll give you a sense of how this all kind of got started. She had straight for the blue tricycle parked under the Christmas tree. In her pink and white special occasion dress and bare feet, she pushes the trike back and forth a few times before clambering onto the seat and trying the pedals. Next, she's sitting on the floor, opening more presents, throwing wrapping paper, tissue, and box lids over her shoulder like it's old hat, although she's just a toddler. She glances at the camera once or twice. Mainly, she focuses on her gifts sometimes turning to her father for affirmation of how she should react to the bounty spread before her. Her mother films it all. They are not yet my mother and father. An 8x10 framed photograph of her sits atop a table in the background. She concentrates as she pulls the next doll or toy out of her box or bag. One of the presents is a tiny pair of flip-flops. Her dad helps her with them, fumbling a bit, putting them on the wrong feet. Christmas tree tinsel dangles in clumps from the bottom branches almost to the floor. The mountain of present seems never ending. It's a bright, warm scene. I can almost smell the breakfast they've had, or the coffee brewing, or the turkey that may already be roasting in the oven. I'm named after her, this child in the grainy video who died when she was three years old, eight and a half years before I was born. Up until now, I've only seen her in small black and white photographs in which she seemed frozen and far, far away. Now in my 40s, I'm watching her spring to life for the first time. My husband, Paul, and I watch the video on our TV. Later, I'll add it to my desktop and watch it over and over again. Now, this first time, I brace myself for, I'm, for what I'm about to see. I arm myself with tissues, lean forward, hold my breath, and I cry and cry. In our family, she's always been called the first Kristen. My parents are voracious readers who named their daughter after the heroine in Sigrid Lindset's Kristen Lovren's Daughter trilogy, set in medieval Norway. I find myself now needing to explore this act of naming, this legacy, this spectral sister. I feel sorry for her, robbed of life at such a young age. I even miss her sometimes, if it's possible to miss someone you've never met. I want to know more about her. I want it known that she existed, that her time on earth mattered. I want to reflect on what having her name means for me and my family. Write what's tearing at your heart, what you need to resolve, Ana Castillo advises her students. I had originally written, I want her to know she's not forgotten. But as Undertaker Thomas Lynch affirms, quote, there is nothing, once you are dead, that can be done to you, or for you, or with you, or about you, that will do you any good or any harm. Remember, he repeats several times, the dead don't care. All the same, undertakings carry tremendous significance, for they are the things we do to vest the lives we lead against the cold, the meaningless, the void, the noisy blather, and the blinding dark. That beautiful language is from him. Our undertakings, Lynch claims, seek to make some sense of life and living, dying and the dead. To undertake is to bind oneself to the performance of a task, to pledge or promise to get it done. So I set out to perform the task of writing about the first Kristen, binding myself to this lost little girl to try to know her better, understand myself more deeply, and explore the unique phenomenon of a family with one name for two sisters. This is my pledge, my promise to her. I know she doesn't care, that the dead don't care. Yet doesn't the phrase nevertheless imbue the dead with some semblance of agency? So throughout this process, I did all kinds of research on the internet, very sophisticated stuff like Wikipedia and things like that. <laughs> Um, so this, this uh, next bit is a little bit about learning about um, what I came to realize was um, a word called, the word is necronym. Necronym. The word arose from my internet searches on, quote, naming child after deceased sibling. I had never heard it before. 
According to Wikipedia, it's a reference to or name of a person who has died. In the article, What's in a Necronym, Jeannie Venasco gets more specific. Quote, it usually means a name shared with a dead sibling, she writes. Venasco's middle name, which she goes by, is that of her father's first child, who died in a car accident when she was 16, eight years before the next Jeannie was born. And the next Jeannie didn't learn about her deceased half-sibling until she was eight years old, and then only sort of accidentally. Until the late 19th century, Venasco writes, necronyms were not uncommon among Americans and Europeans. If a child died in infancy, his or her name was often given to the next child, a natural consequence of high birth rates and high infant mortality rates. She cites Ludwig van Beethoven, Vincent van Gogh, and Salvador Dali as among those who bear the name of a deceased sibling. In their 1989 Dictionary of Superstitions, she continues, folklorists Iona Opie and Moira Tatum offer one reason for the necronym's decline. Many parents feared it was a murderous curse. Another possible curse, the name haunts the child for life. Have I been haunted? By the thought of my parents' grief, yes. By having the name, no, I don't think so. In fact, I've sometimes felt the first Kristen and I have shared a very close conspiracy, to quote Virginia Woolf's description of her bond with her sister Vanessa. You knew Virginia Woolf was gonna be in. <laughs> She's all over this book. I say this because there have been several times in my life when I'm pretty sure I might have died, but didn't. When I was two and drank a bottle of cough medicine, codeine, the year my family lived in Cologne, Germany, I was able to reach it on the top of the low refrigerator and guzzle the whole thing down. I was rushed to the emergency room and had my stomach pumped, all the while I'm told, yelling, nine, nine. My dad was at a conference in another town and got a call to get to the hospital immediately. Here we go again, he thought. The doctor said that if I survived, there would likely be brain damage. There wasn't, although my siblings got a lot of mileage out of that. <laughs> when I was 15, babysitting two young children for a family in the neighborhood, it was dark, the doorbell rang, and I opened it to an unremarkable looking woman who asked if she could come in and use the phone. I can't remember why. She ran out of gas, had a flat tire. Against my better judgment, I let her in. About 20 seconds later, the mother's brother happened to stop by and come into the house for something. Seeing him, the woman hurriedly left. Phil looked at me in surprise and disappointment and said never to let a stranger into the house again. Who knows what might have happened had he not come by? Who knows who else was in her car waiting to Robbed the house, hurt the children, hurt me. When I was 17 and took my parents' brand new Camry out for a spin on country roads with my friend Mia, snow was starting to thaw, the first scent of spring was in the air, and my favorite thing to do on days like that was drive around with the windows down and music blasting. World Party's first record and In Excess is the Swing are perfect for this. Mm -hmm. I have just dated myself. <laughs> <laughs> we drove around a curve going much too fast and hit a patch of ice. The car fishtailed wildly on the narrow road with a drop into a wooded area on either side. Somehow we didn't flip or go over the edge. We just skidded to a halt, sat in shock for a minute, and slowly drove to a car wash. Is it too woo-woo to imagine the first Kristen was watching over me, making sure our parents didn't lose another child, especially the one with the same name? Of course it is. But I will fess up and say that for a long time, I believed she was my guardian angel. I don't ever recall specifically asking my parents about their decision to name me Kristen, but I must have because I remember a time when my mother talked about it and I don't think she would have unless I brought it up first. We were outside walking somewhere when she said, we didn't name you after her, we just liked the name, citing our middle names as proof. Mine's Elizabeth, hers was Mary. Even at age 11 or 12, hearing this from my mother though, I thought there must be more to it than that. Surely there were other names to choose from that they liked. Surely they must have realized this was a little odd. Surely they could imagine how others, their family and friends, might react upon hearing they'd named their newborn Kristen. Did they consider the possible ramifications of this naming? Did they imagine how it might make them feel over the years? Did they later think about how it might be affecting my sister, Cynthia, born 18 months after the first Kristen died? Or my brother, Ted, born three years after that? Or me? Maybe by the time I came along, enough time had gone by since the death that they simply recycled the name they liked. But I'm not so sure. As my friend Annie said, one can only believe there's more to it. But, she added, there's also something perfect about her simple answer. 
I guess when we named you Kristen, we were trying to preserve the memory of her life, my dad emailed me when I embarked on this project. I hope you never thought that we were trying to erase your identity in any way. I did think back then perhaps we should have named you Elizabeth Kristen rather than the other way around. He reiterated these sentiments in another email. All I can say is that we wanted a daughter with the name of Kristen, he wrote, although we did not think twice in giving Cynthia her name. But by the time we were born, a lot of years had passed, and we still loved the name, suggested to us by Kristen Robbins' daughter. We almost named you Elizabeth Kristen, but did not give much thought to how you would feel about the name years later. Perhaps we should have, but we wanted to keep Kristen in the picture. We talked a lot about it before deciding for sure, my mother has said, but we wanted a child named Kristen. We love the name. At least one person who knows my parents well assumed that my dad was the one who pushed for the name more so than my mom. But it sounds like it was a matter of some urgency for both of them. Okay, um, so the video that I spoke about as the book begins um, I kind of punctuate the book throughout with scenes from this video as I am sort of thinking about all these issues. The video's technicolor blew me away. Well, everything blew me away, but those colors, all the photographs I've seen, I had seen from that era, the early years of my parents' marriage, their pictures of the, their pictures of the first Kristen are black and white except for a few that were colorized and therefore rather odd looking. So when the flash drive arrived in my mailbox bearing 15 minutes of salvaged 55 year old video, I expected to see faded and fuzzy blacks, whites, and grays. But it's in glorious technicolor, and after about seven minutes of my parents' cross country road trip, Yosemite, Old Faithful, black bears sauntering up to cars and getting a donut, it's the mid 1950s after all, a visit with my dad's parents at their lakeside cottage in Wisconsin, and a few sec seconds of hectic black squiggles on an ivory screen. There she is, making a grand entrance, literally, for our parents have staged it so that she walks through a door that one of them has opened while out of sight behind the scenes. The first Kristen gives the camera a shy smile as she walks by, her fingers held up to her mouth. There's no audio, which for some reason makes it all the more devastating. I have just a handful of memories from my childhood in which my parents alluded to or spoke directly about her. I don't remember what precipitated the comment, but I recall being in the car with my mother one day, I was maybe seven or eight, when she said of the first Kristen, she went straight to heaven and pointed at the sky. There used to be a car wash in South Bend, Indiana, where I grew up at Hill and LaSalle called High Low Car Wash. The kind where you get out of your car, go inside, and then watch your vehicle through a huge window as it rode the conveyor getting doused, soaked, and rinsed. My mother came home one day and told me that the man standing next to her watching his own car go by had tears streaming down his face. She approached him and said, excuse me, are you all right? He told her his child had died. She said to him, you'll never get over it, but you'll learn to live with it. This would have been about 20 years after the first Kristen's death. Approaching a stranger in distress, that's my mother through and through. Endlessly curious about the world around her with the loquacity to match, she stood near this man, became aware of his crying, and felt compelled to approach him. I, found, I find added poignancy in his efforts to resume a normal routine, taking care of mundane tasks like getting the car washed. I hope my mother's words gave him some comfort, perhaps a brief moment when he could at least imagine there might be a day in the future with no tears. I used to see her afterwards everywhere, my mother would tell me. I'd walk through a store and whirl around because I could have sworn I saw her out of the corner of my eye. I can imagine. One night a couple of years ago, Paul and I were out to dinner, seated at the bar where we generally prefer to sit. There was an enclosed patio off the restaurant with an eye shot of where we were sitting. At one point, a young family got up from the patio and walked back through the restaurant to leave. I sat up, bolt upright in my seat, and stared, because holding the hand of her parent was a beautiful little three or four year old girl who to me looked exactly like the first Kristen. I mean, exactly. As they walked by, the little girl turned around, made eye contact, eye contact with me, smiled, and waved. In a jam-packed, noisy restaurant, she turned and looked right at me. Then she turned back around and left. One Christmas Eve, my parents opened their front door and found a stray kitten outside, mewing to be let in. 
The first Kristen had been begging for a kitten, but my parents, for some reason, didn't want to get one. As a child, I grew upset at this part of the story, imagining them placing a tiny kitten back out into the snow and freezing temperatures. But then I remembered it was warm where they were. Telling the story decades later, my mother remains amazed at the coincidence, happy accident, miracle. What to call this gift, if only of a few hours, given to their child on what would be her last Christmas? Um, so as you may imagine, a lot of this um, brings in literature that I read, and so things about this reminded me of certain things I have read. Um, while I was thinking about all this, I would read a poem here or a poem there, and it would just kind of strike me. So there's, of course, literature all throughout here, and this is an example of that. She looks like us, my brother said, telling me about the video before sending it. Us. The four of us are an us. We look alike. More than that, we are each other, which I learned to my astonishment from poet Hyde Erdrich's book, Cell Traffic. I bought it because she's Louise Erdrich's sister, my favorite living writer, who has a new novel coming out tomorrow, just in uh, And I wanted to see if the talent runs in the family. It does. Because I'd like to support Louise's independent bookstore, Birch Bark Books, and because I've been immersing myself for many years in Native American women's writing. Opening Cell Traffic, I read one of several epigraphs that took my breath away. Quote, in fact, some readers now think that most of us, if not all, are chimeras of one kind or another. Far from being purebred individuals composed of a single genetic line, our bodies are cellular mongrels, teeming with cells from our mothers, maybe even from grandparents and siblings. This is a quotation taken from an article by Claire Ainsworth called The Stranger Within. I believe I stopped breathing altogether when a few pages later I encountered Erdrich's poem, Micro Chimerism. Nub of human, the poem begins. Shell pink fingernail. Whether you live or all unformed leave her body, she will never be without you. This, scientists tell us, is literally true. The cells from her miscarriages, her stillborns, and all of her children, we carry them for a lifetime but the cells actually go both ways. Nub of human, your cells migrate, are found at sites hurt in the maternal body, and in successive siblings, even those you never knew, even those who never knew you. I never knew the first Kristen, she never knew me, but her cells circulate through my body, and Cynthia's, and Ted's, although the poem cites the mother's privileged claim to those cells. She will never be without you, Erdrich writes, a line repeated twice, words to comfort the lost child, along with the grieving mother. Uh, sorry, <laughs> okay. Um, words to comfort the lost child, along with the grieving mother. But what words are there to comfort the father? Should I have my mother read this? Hey mom, did you know the first Kristen cells still circulate in your body? I wondered how I could press either of my parents about her too deeply without causing them pain. They were in their 80s. I couldn't and still can't bear the thought of eliciting their tears, just beneath the surface for my father, buried a bit more deeply in my mother. On the surface, or perhaps stereotypically, it seems like it would be the reverse. I've already mentioned that my mother's a great talker. Throughout my childhood and well beyond, she'd get together with friends over glasses of wine, and in the old days, cigarettes, and they could be heard talking and laughing late into the night, often on our front porch, weather permitting. My friend Cece across the street remembers falling asleep on summer nights with the sound of our mother's laughter wafting in through her open window. My mom and I loved talking together as well, and always did, until she became hard of hearing, making phone conversations difficult, and I've never thought of her as shying away from tough subjects. My dad was an academic, his mind fully on his work wherever he happened to be, alone in his office, on a family vacation, and all points between. It was tough to grab or maintain his attention sometimes. When we were growing up, he appeared most interested in how we were doing in school. That seemed to be the best way he could connect with us, where we could meet on common ground. I remember him telling, him, telling, him he loved, telling me he loved me daily, and his patience with our nonsense when we were kids generally knew no bounds. It's impossible to encapsulate personalities in just a few sentences, and I don't know whether any of these reflections lend insights into my parents' emotional tenor. 
I don't know whether someone's day-to-day -day personality, when things are smoothly ticking along, offers any indication of how he or she will react to trauma or tragedy at the time it occurs, or years, or decades later. Looking back, I think my parents strike, struck just the right balance, if there is such a thing, about such an issue, concerning talk about the first Kristen. I don't recall ever not knowing about her. Unlike other families I have read about who maintain a shroud of silence and secrecy around the death of a child. I remember fragments of stories my parents would tell, of her rep repeatedly flinging a spoon across the room, of a car trip when a stuffed animal went out the window, of the time my mother saw the first Kristen heading out the front door with a snack in one hand and a stuffed animal in the other. Where are you going? My mother asked. I'm running away, she said. Oh, my mother replied. Well, good luck. See you soon. <laughs> she then walked around the house and sat on the back steps. She was really little, my mother said laughing. How did she even know about running away? <laughs> this is the only story I've heard in which the first Kristen speaks, in which she has a voice. A voice suggesting a budding perception of herself as an individual, as one apart, as someone who can make her own decisions. She used to enjoy sitting on women's laps and combing their hair. And we learned of her death in California, where they were living at the time. Only temporarily they knew, so they had her buried in my father's family plot in Chilton, Wisconsin. There was no way we were going to leave her behind, my mother has said. California made it all seem even more remote. To a kid growing up in South Bend, Indiana, it may as well have been another planet. Um, okay. So this is a little bit of um, wondering about who she was, what she was like, that sort of thing. What kind of individual was the first one of us, the first Kristen? I read pieces I come across about families contending with the loss of a child, such as Tom Hart's graphic memoir, Rosalie Lightning, which tells of the sudden death of his almost two-year-old daughter. I realize that I'm beginning to collect the stories of dead children, he writes, as he and his wife mourn their loss. I am curating such a collection as well. Wait, this is really awkward thing. <laughs> Goodness, okay. I get yeah. um, In Children Don't Always Live, Jason Green writes of the death of his two-year-old daughter, Greta, killed when a piece of masonry fell eight stories from an improperly maintained building and struck her in the head while she sat on a bench on the Upper West Side of Manhattan with her grandmother. He's written quite a lot about this, and you may recall seeing his op-eds. Um, this would happen in 2015. He considers her full, promising life at the time. At two, your child is a person, he says. She has options and fixed beliefs, preferences and tendencies, a group of friends and favorite foods. How much more so for an almost four-year-old? Studies say our personality is fixed by about age five, which means the first Christian was very nearly fully formed. What sort of person was she? Probably hyper-articulate, as firstborns generally are. My dad said she was precocious and the joy of our lives. My mother said smart as a whip. What were her likes and dislikes? Her favorite toys and stuffed animals? Did she gravitate toward books? Had she begun to learn to read? Did she have friends? Did she have a sense of humor? What were her habits? Was she left-handed like I am? These are the things I want to know, and I have asked my parents if they would be willing to tell me more about her. Of course, they would always say, but they never did. Uh, <coughs> I recently reread Louise Erdrich's novel, The Rose, about a man who kills his friend's five-year-old son, Dusty, in a hunting accident. Nearly suicidal with sorrow and remorse, Landro Iron and his wife, Emmeline, following ancient Ojibwe tradition, give their own beloved five-year-old son, La Rose, to Dusty's grieving parents. The novel explores how each family copes with this tragic and ultimately redemptive situation. What struck me when I read the book <coughs> a second time while writing about the first Christian is that the novel delves only slightly into Dusty's life. The reader never gets to know him. Maybe that's because he was already known by his parents and older sister Maggie and by his best friend, La Rose. Their grieving doesn't entail reiterating his personality, his habits, his idiosyncrasies. They aren't trying to capture something intangible the way I am. No one who knew and loved him needed to piece his life together in this manner. I attended a roundtable discussion on La Rose at a conference a couple of years ago. I raised this point in the Q&A period after the presentations, asking the panelists whether they found it odd that the novel doesn't provide a fuller portrait of Dusty. Before any of them answered, an older man in the audience chimed in with, how could it have? 
What's there to say? Five-year-old doesn't even really have a personality. I remained silent. I feared that if I spoke up, I'd become too emotional. What a thing to say. Clearly this man doesn't have children, I thought, or any real experience of them. And I was surprised when no one on the panel, all women, offered a rejoinder to his comment. In his anguished and ultimately hopeful essay, Green says he and his wife recently had a baby boy, but he worries that his grief will negatively affect this child's life, that it will seep into his new baby as he cradles it against his chest. Is he doomed to live under the shadow, he asks, of what happened to his sister? Only time will tell. Have I been living under a shadow? Um, okay. So this is, this gets into a little bit of background on um, how she died. After watching the video of the first Kristen, after reading Microchimerism, I emailed my brother and sister and began asking questions. It occurred to me that the three of us had never discussed any of this. The first Kristen, my name, our parents' grief, none of it. We first went over the chain of events as we knew them. As the first Kristen began to walk, to, excuse me, to grow and walk, my parents learned she had scoliosis. Infantile idiopathic scoliosis, I learn, is the name given to the diagnosis in children from infancy through age three. Or maybe it was congenital scoliosis, when the spine becomes malformed in the womb. More than 80% of scoliosis are idiopathic, I read, so there's no known cause. Doctors told my parents there were two options. Their daughter could either be in back braces and casts until she was through puberty, or she could have surgery right away to correct the curvature once and for all. In fact, she wore a plaster cast from collarbone to hips for the last year of her life. It's apparent in pictures. Her little dresses jut out a bit, and if she's wearing pants, the shape of the cast can be detected underneath. I can't imagine wearing a plaster cast like that for months on end. The stiffness, the itching, the California heat, I don't think I could stand it. My mother says she never complained and quickly learned to adjust. She used to go down the slide on her stomach, she told me recently. She realized she couldn't slide down as well on her bottom, so she just flipped over and went down that way. My parents opted for surgery, presumably with the greatest of assurances from the doctors. They watched their perfect, healthy child enter the operating room, and they waited. She never came out. It was March 8, 1961. My dad explained the cause to us kids as lack of adrenaline. My brother provided more details. As it's been explained to me, he wrote in an email to my sister and me, the problem turned out to be that she had underdeveloped adrenal glands. Apparently, as you're taking off general anesthesia, the, the adrenaline in your system is what gets heart, lungs, etc., to kick back in and function on their own. As I understand it, the mechanics of the surgery itself went as planned, but as they took her off the anesthesia, her heart and lungs didn't restart due to a lack of adrenaline. I have since learned the term for underdeveloped adrenal glands, hypoadrenalism. I read about it in an effort to understand it more and soon found myself mired in the complexities of the condition. It has to do with the deficiency of the steroid hormone cortisol, which is a potential fatal deficiency if left undetected, clearly. I learned that a simple blood test can determine cortisol levels and therefore any necessary treatment for hypoadrenalism. The main problem, I read, is that the need for cortisol increases during physical stress, such as major surgery. Yes. Thus my parents, especially my father's ensuing fear of surgery and hospitals. He couldn't bear them. Another thing I learned about while working on this and writing about this is a phenomenon that occurs in families when one child has died and there are and other children came along, um, and it's called replacement child syndrome. I always felt like I had to live up to an impossible standard, my sister said. The term replacement child was coined in the 1960s by psychologists Albert Kane and Barbara Kane in reference to a child who was conceived to take the place of a child who has died. Over the years, the term has been expanded to include a child who is already a member of the family. This is a quote from the book. Uh, but takes on the role of a dead or impaired sibling, as well as a child who was adopted to replace an idealized child his or her parents were unable to conceive. So says replacement children, the unconscious script. 
The authors explained that the term has come to denote not necessarily the parent's conscious decision to replace a child, but rather the child's experience of feeling like a replacement. The book is blurbed by a clinical psychologist, a professor of psychiatry, and a child bereavement counselor. So I bought it, and for better or for worse, some of it struck a chord. It includes sections like what's in a name and naming a child after deceased sibling, a blessing or an albatross. Great. <laughs> for many replacement children, the authors write, being named for a deceased sibling carries consequences that may follow them the rest of their lives. The expectation placed upon them by the parents that they, the replacement child, will fulfill the hopes and dreams of the deceased child is now compounded and cemented by giving the very same name as the deceased sibling. It's as if the replacement child does not have the right to their own identity. And when that happens, this is all a quote from the book, they may not know who they are, why they're here, and there may be real confusion and conflict while navigating the road towards selfhood. I read these words over and over, but cannot find myself in them. And I wonder how to detect the difference between ordinary confusion and conflict while navigating the road towards selfhood to be expected of anyone, and particular issues stemming from having the name of a dead sibling. Salvador Dali was named after a brother who was born in 1901 and died of gastroenteritis nine months before the second Salvador was born in 1904. It seems as if his mother, as many women were at this time, advised by doctors to have another child as soon as possible. On a visit to the first Salvador's grave uh, with his family when he was five years old, lore has it, Salvador's father told him that he was the reincarnation of his brother. Dali believed this to be true. One saying of his brother, we, quote, resembled each other like two drops of water, but we had different reflections. Rereading one of my favorite novels, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, I was struck by something I had never picked up on before. Heathcliff was a replacement child. As Nellie Dean explains to Mr. Lockwood, Mr. Earnshaw had found the dirty, ragged, black-haired child on the streets of Liverpool and brought him home to be part of his family. I found they had christened him Heathcliff, Nellie continues. It was the name of a son who had died in childhood, and it has served him ever since, both for Christian and surname. Earnshaw grows to favor Heathcliff above his biological children, Kathy and Hindley. Did he do so because he considered Heathcliff his reincarnated son? And is this a factor in why Hindley despises Heathcliff so much? And just a couple more passages. Um, okay. Just further reflection on all of these issues. In Chicago recently, which is now about over two years ago, it was recently one of those. In Chicago recently, I paused in front of a sculpture by Donald Judd in the Chicago Art Institute's Modern Way. I found the work arresting on its own, and even more so, with spines on my mind, after reading the description affixed to the wall. The artist's signature stacks, the artist's signature stacks of identical cantilevered wall boxes run like a spine connecting floor, wall, and ceiling. Judd was exacting. The space between each box unit is equal in height to the boxes themselves, for instance. And yet, the spaces between these boxes are also tinted by a warm, soft amber glow. This work hides nothing at the same time it remains perceptually surprising, even elusive. Elusive. A small child glimpsed under cellophane in old photo albums and, as was more often the case, in piles of pictures stashed in envelopes. A shadow sibling, known, barely, through disconnected fragments doled out sporadically and then less and less frequently over nearly 50 years. As I hold the first Kristen steadily in my mind now, however, gently probing my parents for their memories and details, asking my siblings for their thoughts, repeatedly watching the video, rereading various poems, and learning about replacement children and spines and scoliosis, she begins to assume greater shape. She attains greater solidity. That evanescent figure in the old photographs is becoming her own person. She grows familiar to me, and I begin to see her as a warm, if elusive, connector of me to my other siblings and to my parents, but especially to her. I begin to feel like her protective big sister rather than the other way around, rather than the way it was supposed to be. Antelope Woman is Louise Erdrich's revision of her 1998 novel, The Antelope Wife. She has explained in interviews that her stories and novels never truly end as far as she's concerned, and that she wanted to return to The Antelope Wife to right some of the wrongs she felt she had done to her characters. The earlier novel includes the accidental death of an 11-year-old girl, Deanna, 
who leaves behind her devastated parents and twin sister Callie. In the revision, Deanna lives. And this is approaching the end where I'm reflecting a little bit on the process of writing all of this. I think about what I've accomplished in writing this memoir and what still needs to be done. How do I feel now, having been through this process? What should I feel? What do I think about the first Kristen now? Do I know her better? What do I know about myself and my family that I didn't realize before? Has this brought us all closer together? Have I changed in some way? In The Truth About Stories, a native narrative, Thomas King ends each chapter the same way. Take this story, for instance. It's yours. Do with it what you will. Make it the topic of a discussion group at a scholarly conference. Put it on the web. Forget it. But don't say in the years to come that you would have lived your life differently if only you had heard this story. You've heard it now. Now that I've heard the story of the first Kristen, will I live my life differently? Except that I'm still not sure I have actually heard it. When all is said and done, I still know more about her death than her life. It's like we were always told about these things, but not the specifics Cynthia recently texted. Moreover, this is Cynthia's story, as well as the first Kristen's and mine. And above all, it's our parents' story. What do I hope they get or got out of my writing this memoir? Certainly, I want them to know how much I appreciate the life they have given me. I want to demonstrate that I have lived it to the best of my ability. Early in Virginia Woolf's novel, Mrs. Dalloway, Clarissa Dalloway sits mending her dress in preparation for her party that night when her old friend, Peter Walsh, whom she had almost married decades before, stops by to see her after spending several years abroad. Do you remember the lake? Clarissa asks him. Under the pressure of an emotion which caught her heart, made the muscles of her throat stiff, and contracted her lips in a spasm as she said lake. For she was a child throwing bread to the ducks between her parents, and at the same time a grown woman coming to her parents who stood by the lake, holding her life in her arms, which, as she neared them, grew larger and larger in her arms, until it became a whole life, a complete life, which she put down by them and said, this is what I have made of it, this. And what had she made of it? What indeed, sitting there sewing this morning with Peter? If I could carry my life in my arms and present it to my parents, what would it show? What contours, what heft would it assume? Would it be enough to compensate for their loss? I'll go ahead and stop there. 